Support for this program is provided by the Foundation for Excellence in Louisiana Public Broadcasting and from viewers like you. Hello and welcome to a special edition of Louisiana Public Square. I'm Beth Courtney, president of LPB. Joining me for our legislative look back is LPB news anchor Natasha Williams. Well, busy session. It was a very busy session. Well, it's official. The 2019 legislative session is in the books. Absent this year was the budget drama seen in previous sessions thanks to a sales tax passed last year and after much back and forth. Disagreements this session centered on how to spend new money rather than the usual where to cut debate. Well, lawmakers approved a $30 billion state budget for the fiscal year starting July 1st. Spending will be increased for colleges, health services, and early childhood education. The TOPS tuition program will be funded to cover all eligible students, and a total of 96,000 public school teachers, school personnel, and support workers will see a bump in pay. The issue of teacher pay raises was a topic of January's Louisiana Public Square. While support for a pay increase seemed universal at the time, questions still remained. How could a raise be funded? Should it be across the board or used as an incentive to recruit needed subject area teachers? Well, we brought together educators, administrators, and decision makers to explore the value of teachers. And what are those things that we were calling bad that we said are unfair? What are we saying those things are, Miss Erin? Injustice. Injustices. Amelia Gilmore is using Ms. a book Sam. about the civil rights movement to teach her second grade students vital reading comprehension skills. So we're learning about um, different civil rights leaders and how they addressed injustices. And through that, we're doing right now main idea and details. Gilmore is new this year to the Baton Rouge Center for Visual and Performing Arts but she's in her fourth year of teaching. A perk of her new school is a shared fund for classroom supplies, an exception rather than the rule. Previously, I was at a school where I had to spend hundreds of dollars of my own money supplying my students with supplies if they didn't have them, general supplies for my classroom, such as printer ink and things like that, and additionally, um, just books for my classroom library I would purchase. Gilmore has a master's degree and currently earns about $3,000 less than the southern regional average of $50,955. Louisiana teachers, on average, earn about $1,200 less, or $49,745. Governor John Bell Edwards plans to recommend a $1,000 teacher pay increase to the legislature this April. Teachers haven't received a raise in a decade. $1,000 is not enough. Keith Corville is the executive director of Associated Professional Educators of Louisiana. Unlike state teacher unions, Corville's group is pushing for a $3,000 increase. Teachers' salaries are currently funded by the state through the Minimum Foundation Program, or MFP, with additional amounts added by local districts. But Corville says a raise needs to happen at the state level. In order to increase our state average, we have to go to the MFP and we have to go to state funding sources. As it is now, there are several rural parishes in Louisiana that are unable to provide higher pay for teachers because they don't have the local base of revenue. Stephen Wagesback is a member of the MFP task force. Wagesback says increasing the amount of the MFP is one option to financing a pay raise. And if you incorporate the salary supplement inside the MFP, the thought is, is that it becomes more likely to become a continuous or a recurring investment. Also, the legislature and the governor have the option of doing an investment outside the MFP through the typical budget appropriation process. That is more commonly done for a one-year or maybe two-year investment and not an automatic recurring investment. Wagesback hopes that whatever the final plan is, it addresses teacher shortages and gives districts flexibility in how they invest new dollars. We would encourage policymakers, as you implement this much needed pay raise for teachers, try to prioritize it in high need areas like early education and math and science, and try to prioritize it for those teachers that are performing at a high level so you can reward them and encourage other teachers to also reach that level. 
Complicating the possibility of a teacher pay raise is the failure of legislators to approve the revenue estimating conference's forecast. House Republican leaders twice blocked efforts to recognize $43 million in new revenue, citing concerns about dropping oil prices. I think it's prudent of the speaker and Chairman um, Henry to wait until we actually have um, some, you know, set numbers and we know exactly how much money we're going to have before we can say whether we can afford it or not. Nancy Landry is a Republican representative from Lafayette and chair of the House Education Committee. She says the majority of members support raising teachers' pay. We want to make sure that their salary is competitive. Um, the only concern is that um, there's not an appetite to raise taxes, and so if, if it would require a tax increase, I think you would see some opposition to it. But right now we're still hopeful that we can accomplish um, some sort of pay raise without raising taxes. Landry would also like to see discussions on increasing teacher advancement opportunities, as well as exploring where current education money is going. We've been spending at the national average in per pupil spending, but our outcomes are at the bottom. And so it makes sense to examine the way we've been spending the money and make sure that we're spending it in a smart way in the future because we want to have different outcomes. We want to have better outcomes for our students. Louisiana spends over $12,000 per student on public education, just $300 less than the national average, but over 2000 more than nearby southern states. Yet Louisiana received a D-minus from Education Week in its 2018 K-12 Achievement Index. A large part of Louisiana's per-pupil spending, Wagesback says, goes towards teachers' pensions. There have been proposals over the last couple of years to um, modernize our pension systems, to make them more relevant to today's teachers and also save some costs for these superintendents and these school boards. Those efforts have been blocked by the unions and by the governor. We hope they change their mind this year, and it's the appropriate time to bring that topic up. Gilmore says that a $1,000 raise is appreciated and a good start, but the state still has a long way to go in terms of valuing its teachers. There are days that we act as a mother in addition to teachers, days that we act as a counselor in addition to being a teacher. We have an impact on our students individually as well as an impact on the community that our students are a part of through the things that we share with them. We have such high expectations now and the bar has risen for students and since the bar has risen for students so many times we teachers are expected to help students reach that bar so we have had to uh, work extra hours, lots of extra hours. I have no personal life. I, I don't have a family life. I don't get, I only get paid 7.5 hours per day um, for 182 days. I calculated that I work an extra 500 hours per year, which comes out to be over $19,000. I've been teaching, this is my 35th year no. in public education, and I've seen so many of my colleagues retire early. I've seen so many of them go back to graduate school, and I'm a science teacher, so these, these folks are going back and getting master's degrees in science and technology and going to industry, and they're leaving us. I've seen more and more uncertified teachers coming into our classroom, and we do the best we can to support sure. them, because not only do we teach children, we teach our teachers, and we support each other. The governor has made a very strong commitment that th he will propose a thousand dollar across the board pay raise for teachers, five hundred dollars across the board for support employees. I was in a meeting with him today and he has committed to making sure that that money is in his executive budget. Regardless of what happens with you know, the, the, the talk and the debate about the revenue estimating and so forth, he will definitely have that in his executive budget. Should it be a flat across the board pay raise or should there be some structure to the pay raise maybe giving extra weight to uh, for instance, special ed teachers or younger teachers coming out of school to try to lure them into the profession. Uh, now, perhaps the governor uh, should be looking at that type of an approach rather than just say, oh, we're going to give it across the board of $1,000. Maybe it ought to be $1,200, but maybe some of those special weighted areas get a little bit more as a percentage than the regular, uh, the regular uh, uh, teachers. A flat raise across the board does not do anything for the disparity that you might have 
between districts in regions of the state. There have been some school systems that have gone out to the local voters and they have passed significant pay raises for the teachers in those districts. The other issue is whenever you look back at what the legislature had done, and over the years they've given teacher pay raises and they've done it in several fashions. Number one was a flat pay raise. Number two, when you look at 2013 when they did a supplement and it was based on the relative wealth of the individual districts and then it was incorporated into the MFP so that those raises could be maintained. And I think you have to look at the various scenarios and determine what is the way, best way to impact the profession and to bring in people who want to get into education. Teachers never will get rich on the salaries that they make. But that is a trade-off that we make when we go into education, knowing that there are some perks, and our pension is one of those perks. If you look at what uh, our teachers were paid in 1994 throughout the, the nation, uh, the Economic Policy Institute has those numbers, and they estimated that we were being paid about 2% less than other similarly educated professionals. In 2015, <coughs> the numbers show that we're being paid 17% less, and that's probably a greater difference today. So we, ha we can't, or we aren't, actually keeping up with the salaries that are being paid to other professionals similar to our uh, educational level. So we have to have something to attract teachers into the profession. And I think that the pension, which is a good one, uh, is one of those perks and one of those incentives to bring people in. The secretaries are the people who meet our parents. The cafeteria ladies, they're the ones who make sure that our children are well nourished. Our custodians make sure that our buildings are well maintained. We need to make sure that we're, we're working together in concert, and we need to make sure that every single individual in the education family is valued. Uh, all these employees that we're talking about are employees of school districts. They are not employees of the state of Louisiana. Uh, and I have to question, as a legislature, why uh, a lot of these districts have not gone out to their people, to their voters, to raise millages, for instance, and increase pay locally. So in addition to supporting the pay raise, the governor is supporting an increase in the block general per pupil allocation of the MFP. That's something that'll be sent to the districts that they can use at their discretion for anything. If they want to uh, adjust uh, uh, salary or, or, or other type things, it is, it is totally up to, to the local districts to how they want to handle that money. Louisiana spends $12,000 plus per child, $2,000 more than the, most, than the average southern state, and yet our results are dead last. They just came out again recently, uh, Ed Weeks published, uh, that we are literally dead last in the south. Uh, one has to, as a legislature, one has to ask if we're spending so much, now some of it's the old UAL, we know that, that's the retirement. The old right. retirement fan. But that doesn't equal that differential. That's a piece of it. So if we're spending this much money, and our teachers, who are number one most uh, priority as far as getting quality education or not getting paid at the right level, legislators have to ask, what, where's the money going? Well, ultimately, House members, in a unanimous vote, approved a $1,000 raise for K-12 through teachers. Support workers will receive an additional $500 annually. And public schools will get $39 million in new money per pupil spending increases. The school financing plan was the centerpiece of Governor John Bell Edwards' agenda. He describes it as the first step in moving teacher pay to the southern average. Well, another agenda item for Governor Edwards was an increase to the minimum wage, the topic of our February Louisiana Public Square. A United Way report notes that two-thirds of jobs in Louisiana pay less than $15 an hour, a challenging wage for a household with children. The governor proposed raising the minimum wage from $7.25 to $8.50 an hour. But is raising the minimum wage the best way to lift Louisiana residents out of poverty? Many high-paying jobs remain unfilled because employers can't find skilled candidates. We brought together business owners, anti-poverty advocates, and labor leaders to look at ways to help the state's working poor move beyond the minimum wage. 
Grace Bailey's weekly routine begins with a trip from her Lafayette home to LSU. Two days a week I'm in Baton Rouge on Mondays and Tuesday, 8.30 to 3.30. And then Wednesday, Thursdays, I'm interning at the family tree as a clinician, so all day long doing counseling work. From there, we'll either teach a yoga class, and then Friday, same thing, um, and then go and do my meditation group, Saturday teachings. A single mother raising a nine-year-old, Bailey is working on a master's degree in social work. Despite holding down two jobs, she constantly faces financial anxiety. The cost of living is extremely high, um, and, and so paying rent is always, always an issue. And I try to budget out um, in advance, but things, things come up. Um, my car battery died the other day trying to get up and go to Baton Rouge. I don't know how I'm going to pay for that. Bailey's a member of the state's working poor, overlooked by traditional poverty classifications. The United Way identifies these individuals as ALICE. ALICE stands for Asset Limited Income Constrained and Employed, and it counts the people not just under the poverty line, but a little bit above that line who are still working and having, uh, but still having a lot of trouble making ends meet. Jan Moeller heads the Louisiana Budget Project. He notes that Louisiana has the nation's second largest poverty rate. But while 19 percent of residents live in poverty, another 29 percent qualify as Alice. So when we think of poverty in Louisiana, we really think about half the population has trouble meeting their basic needs on a month-to-month, week-to-week basis. And that probably needs some sort of hand up in order to survive. Some of those hand ups include Louisiana's expansion of Medicaid and the recent increase of the earned income tax credit for low wage earners. Another boost for the working poor, Moeller says, would be to raise the minimum wage. This session, Governor John Bell Edwards will be pushing for a dollar and 25 cent increase phased in over two years. The federal minimum wage has been stuck at seven dollars and a quarter since 2009, and it has lost a lot of its purchasing power in those years. So raising it to $8.50 an hour is only going to recover a little bit of what we've lost over the past decade, and we frankly think it needs to go a lot higher. Bureau of Labor Statistics indicate that only 40,000 Louisiana workers earn at or below the minimum wage. But a bump for them will likely mean raising other workers' pay. Small business owners worry how to afford that, says Renee Amar with the Louisiana Association of Business and Industry. If I make a nine, and now the, I've been at the business for six months or a year, and the person next to me just got a raise, not by doing anything materially, right? Uh, they're not being more productive. You know, nothing's really changed. Uh, I'm probably going to want to raise too, you know. And so it's this upward pressure of, of wages is what it causes. Amar says companies are leery of an across-the-board wage increase that applies to every type employer. That situation, Moeller says, can be easily resolved. Louisiana was one of the first states in the country in the 1990s to pass a state law that forbids cities and municipalities from deciding on their own what the minimum wage should be. So if we lifted that preemption law, every city in the state could decide for themselves if they want a minimum wage, because it may not be a case where one size fits all. Arkansas, a state with a poverty level close to Louisiana's, has seen two minimum wage increases approved by voters since 2014. While Amar admits a small bump won't break Louisiana's economy, the measure overlooks a better remedy for the working poor. How do we transition these people from these minimum wage jobs, get them the training that really is going to lift them out of poverty? Because, right, giving me, you know, probably $40 a week is, you know, probably going to be helpful. But if I could make another, you know, $200, $300, $500 a week rather than $40, that's life-changing for me. In Louisiana, by the year 2020, which is upon us, 53% uh, of the jobs that are out there are going to need some kind of post-secondary degree, a credential, a regular college degree, or something like that. The problem we have in Louisiana is that only about 45% of our population have that de degree or credential. Barry Irwin heads the Council for a Better Louisiana. He says that the Louisiana Community and Technical College system is combating the state's education gap through programs like... Work Ready You that puts adults re-entering school on track to a career, and Jumpstart, which helps students get certified in a trade. 
what we're really trying to focus on with the Jumpstart program is getting kids while they're still in high school to get a credential that's leading to a high demand job, a high quality job, and a job that really pays a good salary. There are also challenges on the employment side. A Louisiana Budget Project report indicates that of the state's top 10 job growth occupations, half pay below the poverty level for a family of four. In the spring, Bailey will graduate. She plans to help others like herself who face financial uncertainty. When you're impoverished, there's almost more expenses. So applying for credit cards or interest is gonna be higher. Um, you're driving a car that has a lot of mileage on it. And, and, and so having to repair those parts constantly. There's so many things about being impoverished that become more costly in the long run. It's expensive to be poor. I'm a, an anti-hunger policy advocate with the Budget Project. And one thing that we know about the population on food assistance is that two-thirds of uh, people receiving food stamps are either uh, disabled, elderly, or children. And of the remaining third, most people do work. And what that means is that the wages they have aren't enough to support them or their families. Affordable childcare is oftentimes the pathway for a parent to work, to continue school, to access training, so that they can position themselves better in, for a living wage job. Um, we, two out of every three children in our state have either both parents or their single parent in the workforce or in school. So, so many parents in our workforce are needing to have sound, reliable, quality care, not only to give their kids a great start in such an important developmental time of their life, mm -hmm but it helps them to have what they need as a family to be successful in the workforce. ABC offers a uh, high school outreach, and so they sponsor high school students to uh, get involved, something for them to do to learn a trade, because a lot of times in high school, you know, either they're thinking, hey, I'm going to college or I'm not, and they think if they're not going to college, that's the end of the route, and that's not the case. So what ABC offered through contractors, you know, uh, being able to, uh, sponsored that, that individual is they offer an opportunity for you to learn a trade. I got a trade behind me that nobody will ever be able to take away and from that I, you can progress and grow and it opens up a whole new ladder uh, for you and your family, for your finances uh, and the good part about it is once I'm actually in that industry uh, creating an income to support my family I don't owe anybody any money either. What are the barriers to increasing mm -hmm. the minimum wage? What, what's the biggest hurdle that is keeping that from happening? I'll jump in. I, th I think one of the biggest barriers is for some reason, um, some of our friends seem to think that the world will come to an end. Um, if we increase the minimum wage, somehow businesses are gonna flee. Uh, businesses are going to go the, to other states where minimum wage is lower. Well, guess what? You won't find any lower than us. Uh, and the reality that the world will come to an end if we increase minimum wage just hasn't proven to be true. Every time the minimum wage has increased from 295 to 310 and on and on and on, those who said that it was going to be bad were proven to be wrong. For a small business owner, which is very different than a large business owner, than a large corporation, they are going to do d business differently when it comes to labor costs. And whenever you force down arbitrarily higher labor costs on a small business owner, they're already doing what they can to make their bottom line work to keep employees working. They're doing everything to keep their doors open and create jobs. So the second you put down arbitrary new cost, labor costs, which is very expensive, uh, on them, they're gonna have to make decisions. And they're gonna make one of few decisions. One is, do I cut, do I cut hours on those hourly employees? Do I choose cheaper labor? as in part-time or let, you know, go to less expensive labor in the sense that they're gonna go get somebody with even less, uh, less experience? Or do I you know, cut jobs? $1.50 an hour is not gonna raise anybody out of poverty over the next year or so. So what do we really need to be doing as a state to do that? And small business owners, one of our biggest issues right now, one of our top priorities is not having skilled workers, not having people with soft skills or particular skills to be able to fill the jobs that they have open. While it may not, an increase, a modest but meaningful increase, may not move everyone out of poverty, 
it's going to move people closer to being out of poverty. And we have to take modest but meaningful steps. Uh, we do not, it's not the goal to put anyone out of business, but the minimum wage is not currently wage back records from Louisiana's employers bear out that it is not an entry level wage. Nearly 20% of our workers remain at that wage for over a year, and it's primarily women over the age of 24, women taking care of children, which means our children suffer. So anything we can do to help our children will make a difference. And there is also the gender gap. Women in Louisiana earning 69 cents a dollar for the male, from their male counterparts. And don't be African American like myself or Latino, we're gonna earn even less. We have campuses in 53 of the 64 parishes uh, attempting to eliminate some of the geographic disparities that we have in Louisiana to provide opportunities in, in every place uh, so, that, so that everyone has an opportunity to get to that middle class status. Uh, this, this year we're on pace for nearly 30,000 graduates. 30,000 graduates that on average will earn $45,000 a year. When you think about our per capita income at just over 25,000, nearly doubling the per capita income by completing an associate degree or a short-term cer short -term certification at one of our community or technical colleges, it's a game changer. It changes the entire discussion around child care, around transportation, around food security. Uh, so you know, we couldn't be more proud of the work that we've done, but the reality is we have much more work to be, to be done. Uh, we're working very closely with a number of our, our partners in the Workforce Commission and DCFS and others uh, to provide opportunities for our students to have benefits like SNAP uh, like health care benefits on the college campus because it's a short-term opportunity to provide a benefit to someone who is helping themselves to move out of poverty. Uh, so, uh, you know, 20 years, I can't wait to see what the next 20 years will hold for Louisiana's people as a result of the education and training happening at our colleges. Well, when all was said and done, the Republican-led legislature handed Governor Edwards his fourth defeat in attempting to increase the minimum wage. A proposal to let voters decide through a constitutional amendment was pulled once it was evident that it lacked the two-thirds support needed. The House Labor Committee voted down bills that would have allowed cities to determine their own minimum wage and require equal pay for Louisiana women. In March, as the nation's collegiate men's basketball championship kicked off, Louisiana Public Square focused on another issue before the legislature, the legalization of sports betting. Followers of this year's March Madness wagered $8.5 billion during the tournament. While efforts to allow sports betting failed in 2018, a renewed push was made this session, with some lawmakers suggesting revenue be dedicated to early childhood education. We brought together proponents and opponents to answer what are the odds sports betting in Louisiana. In May of last year, the Supreme Court ruled that sports betting is allowed in all 50 states. Since then, there's been a race among state legislatures to legalize it. Today, there are about seven states that are fully in, the entire states are fully in on sports betting. You have some isolated sports betting at some tribal casinos, and in probably 20 other states, it's being debated right now. Ronnie Jones is chairman of Louisiana's Gaming Control Board. He says neighboring Mississippi is among those states with sports wagering already up and running. I think in the, uh, the first five months that uh, it was legal over there, somewhere between September and December, the, uh, the amount wagered was in the neighborhood of $160 million. In fact, the 12 casinos along Mississippi's Gulf Coast brought in more money last year than they have in the past decade. In Louisiana, riverboat casinos saw revenue drop nearly 5% in February compared to last year. While sports betting isn't a huge moneymaker compared to other forms of gambling, Jones says it's used to attract additional income from non-gaming activities. There are a lot of people who may not have been inclined to go to a casino before and play blackjack or poker or a slot machine but they are inclined to go spend some time in a sports bar, place a couple of bets, have a meal, have some cocktails, maybe spend the night. If I was a betting person, I would say this will pass. Representative Joseph Marino and Senator Danny Martini are introducing sports betting proposals this session. Senator Martini will be bringing again uh, the sports betting bill that he brought last session. Uh, and that bill generally uh, authorizes a new form of gaming in Louisiana 
that would have to be uh, put to a statewide election and it would be voted on parish by parish. A statewide vote in November, which legalized playing fantasy sports games online for cash prizes, passed in 47 of Louisiana's 64 parishes. Fantasy sports fans will have to wait to place their bets until the state determines how to tax and regulate it. Under Martini's current bill, sports betting will only take place in brick-and-mortar establishments. I think our initial intent right now is to start with the, the facilities that are already licensed for uh, gaming, which would be your land-based casino, your 15 riverboat casinos, and the four racetracks that uh, have slots in them right now. Total of 20 locations are, um, in the initial bill. The American Gaming Association, an industry group, estimates tax revenue from legalized sports betting in Louisiana could be 52 to 62 million dollars per year. Where this money will go remains to be seen. There's been a lot of talk already about wanting to dedicate it towards early childhood education. Uh, I've also had some people contact me to say we want to dedicate that strictly to infrastructure. Um, but the initial version of this bill is going to start out with this money going into the state general fund. It's a bad bet for the state of Louisiana. It's a bad bet for the families in Louisiana. And it's bad for children. Gambling's only product are losers. Gene Mills is president of the Louisiana Family Forum. The group says it is committed to defending faith, freedom, and the traditional family. Among Mills' objections to sports gaming is that it further expands gambling's misleading business model. We tell people, play every day and get lucky every night. That's not true, but nobody's called them on that. There's a depreciation of their promises in terms of what they return on their investment to the communities, and there's an impact upon families upon individuals and upon businesses and communities that the revenues do not nearly offset. Mills also cites a 2016 study by the University of Louisiana at Lafayette, which found that over 200,000 residents experienced some problem with gambling addiction. And ask anybody at DCFS or, or uh, Department of Health and Hospitals, does the Louisiana incur the cost of those families who impact those 200,000 families? And they will tell you absolutely, and it's a steep price. Another opponent to legalized sports betting is the National Collegiate Athletic Association, or NCAA. The group was one of the losing parties in the suit brought before the Supreme Court last May. The NCAA is very concerned about the integrity of their sports, the integrity of their athletes. Paul West is an attorney who specializes in casino gaming law. He says high-stakes gambling can create situations where a student athlete may be lured into altering a game's outcome. This happened to a Louisiana College basketball player charged with point shaving in 1985. It was at Tulane University that actually shut down their, um, their program for some, I think, close to 10 years. Uh, a, a fellow named Hot Rod Williams was indicted, I don't, and, and two or three other people on the Tulane team. Williams was charged with several counts, including accepting bribes, but ultimately was found not guilty. West says other critics see sports betting as the further exploitation of college players and their amateur status. They're not making millions of dollars that they are making in the NBA. And again, here we are betting on student athletes who are too young to even make a bet. Um, and some people think that's an abuse and that's taking advantage of these young college students. No matter what type of sports gaming legislation is proposed, Jones says the gaming board won't take a position. But from a regulator standpoint, the public is always better served in a regulated gaming market compared to an unregulated market. And there's a huge unregulated market in Louisiana today. My question deals with those college athletes. I graduated from a college that was rocked by a scandal back in 1950. City College of New York, yes. mm -hmm. and their players were pressured by the gambling uh, industry to uh, shave points, as was mentioned earlier in that video clip. What would be done to protect college athletes from these undue pressures that undoubtedly will be put on them? Even putting aside the enormous social cost that uh, usually attend the, the gambling industry in the way that we have seen. There are so many fabulous natural resources in our state. I think gambling is a mirage. I think it 
disappears. I think it's fleeting. And I think we have to build our state economy on something stronger than that. So now that Mississippi has passed their uh, sports betting, you know, we're at a disadvantage. We're losing tax revenue. Uh, the, you know, the, the gambling enthusiast who wants to go place a bet is going to go to Mississippi. Uh, so we ought to recapture that. If we're going to pass this, we really need to have things in place. We need, we have halfway houses for mental health, substance abuse. We need halfway houses for compulsive gamblers when they come out of treatment, have nowhere to go. They need to put more revenue into treatment. We need another inpatient facility. So if they're gonna approve this, we have to be able to meet the needs of the people. Sports betting, uh, the way that I have always described it is that it's, that it's nothing more than an amenity to cut off the ability of Mississippi and Arkansas and the Indian casinos to, to cherry pick uh, our, our gamblers. We're still going to have the problems that, that, that everybody's mentioning that with problem gamblers. The problem we have now is they go to Mississippi. And when they come back here, we have to treat them. Bad people are going to do bad things, no matter as many laws as you pass it, as many rules. You know, I can't tell you that nobody's going to ever try to bribe a basketball player, but, but it exists right now. It existed. 20, uh, whenever the Tulane scandal was, before we had regulated uh, gaming in the states. Our pastors know what is happening because these people are coming and we're having to use our, 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 our benevolence funds, our uh, clothes closets, our food pantries to help these fragmented families that result from uh, problem gambling in our state. And we've got to address that. If we, if we don't think about that, if we don't put our arms out and say, we've got to stop. We're going to create a horrible situation that we'll never get away from. And as far as children gamblers, we're already at a, about an average of 40% from the sixth grade up that are in, engaged in gambling somehow right now. We've got to find solutions to that. And, and again, I contend when we look at what ga gambling adds to the bottom line on the, on the revenue side of the, of the ledger, we need to look at what it takes away from on the expense side. And right now, just for the about 100,000 pathological gamblers we have, it nullifies all the profits that we're seeing in terms of tax revenue uh, that are going into the state coffers. Sports betting is a very interesting topic right now in Louisiana. Um, I think Louisiana, there are a lot of factors that make it of a lot of interest to people, at least um, going by how much feedback I get whenever I write about it. Um, a lot of people in Louisiana are big sports fans between the Saints, Pelicans, LSU. Um, also, there is that element of Mississippi has it, why can't we? Mm -hmm. um, and so I think that there's going to be um, a big push, but again, after having watched consistent you know fights over the budget and every time you end up with even if it's a small pocket of money everybody has their designs on it and so I think that that's really where we're gonna see some of the tension come up during the session is um, where should the money be dedicated to if it's dedicated to anywhere and how people um, kind of square that all out uh, you know to your point of mobile or you know you know the one of the problems there is now is there's mobile now in this state unfortunately it's mm -hmm. illegal uh, in our research, we found that there's over 100 websites in the state that you can go onto right now, typing in Louisiana sports betting mm -hmm. and place bets in offshore accounts. You know, so that is a concern always for us because realistically, we have no authority to go to Antigua or any of these other countries that may be having these these sub websites for us to regulate. So, whether the legislature goes to a mobile or not mobile, unfortunately, right now it is something that's here that we cannot regulate. Well, Natasha's sports gaming appeared to be a sure bet in April, but began to fall apart in late May. Senator Danny Martini's bill had good support in the Senate, but in the House Appropriations Committee, it was loaded with amendments on requiring leagues like the NFL to be the official providers of sports data, and one allowing sports gaming in the state's nearly 28,000 video poker establishments. After those amendments, the bill lost support from the Louisiana Casino Association and the state's Gaming Commission. Lawmakers failed to pass the proposal on the final day of the session. And in a bizarre twist, legislators failed to approve the tax mechanism for fantasy sports games that puts playing on the online games approved by voters in 47 Louisiana parishes in limbo. 
Louisiana's death penalty has been in limbo for over five years. The state's use of lethal injection was put on hold in 2014. After a court challenge, Louisiana also has been unable to purchase the drug it uses in the process for several years. This session measures tackling the issue from opposing sides. They were introduced, one, to make it easier to get lethal drugs by letting providers remain anonymous, and two, others to abolish capital punishment entirely. Well, in March, Louisiana Public Square heard passionate voices from both sides of the death penalty debate. Opponents who say it's expensive and morally wrong, and proponents who say it brings justice to crime victims' families. Together, we explored the penalty of death. On November 19, 1995, Wayne and Carol Gazzardo's lives took a painful detour. It's been miserable. I mean, me and my wife, we're not the same anymore. That Sunday morning, their daughter, Stephanie, was killed while preparing a deposit for the restaurant she managed. Todd Wessinger, a former employee, followed the bartender inside and shot him. Todd then went looking for Stephanie, who, after hearing gunfire, had called 911. And while she was on 911, she gave him the money. She had already given him the money and was begging him not to kill her. Please don't kill me. And his exact words were, you'll tell, shut up, bitch, and he shot her. Wessinger shot and injured another employee, then attempted to shoot the cook in the head, but his gun misfired. He fled and went clothes shopping. They caught him in, in Garland, Texas, nine days later. Uh, they brought him back to Baton Rouge, and then we started our ordeal. Over the next 21 years, Wessinger appealed his conviction, but was rebuffed each time. His last denial was in 2018 by the U.S. Supreme Court in an 8-to-1 decision. Still, his death sentence and that of all 66 inmates on Louisiana's death row is in limbo. A hold was put on executions in 2014 in response to a lawsuit against the state's lethal injection process. Several years ago, there was a case in another state where that protocol was used and an inmate uh, did not, it wasn't effective. And so groups came in, filed lawsuits there, filed here and, and in many other states, uh, basically alleging that it was cruel and unusual punishment. Wilbur Stiles is Louisiana's chief deputy attorney general. He says rather than postponing the lawsuit, which Louisiana has done four times, the state should fight it. He also proposes options to the current injection process and how to secure the needed drugs. Several states have changed their protocol and moved to a different set of drugs. You know, we have a three drug protocol. Some have gone to a two drug protocol or one drug protocol. Most states have also gone through the process of making it uh, the disclosure of that information, the supplier of the drugs and the supply chain of the drugs, making that a non-public record and, and confidential. Major pharmaceutical companies will not sell certain drugs to Louisiana if they will be used in lethal injections. Proposed legislation this session will allow companies who provide the drugs to remain anonymous. Going toward uh, um, an avenue where we're secreting the identities, we're not subjecting these things to public record, I think we're, we haven't gotten to a place where our system is, has enough integrity to do that. Alana Odoms Bear is executive director of the ACLU of Louisiana. The group is opposed to the death penalty and cites the large number of Louisiana death sentences that are reversed or overturned. Per capita, we have the fourth highest exoneration rate, and our uh, rate of overturning uh, sentences of conviction is about 85 percent. And uh, we've had 11 exonerees in Louisiana uh, over the last decade. Abair says the death sentence is also handed out disproportionately to blacks. 66% of the people on death row today are African American. And of the states around the country with more than three people on death row, Louisiana has the highest number of African American people on death row. We really believe that a system that continues to um, arbitrarily target African-American people um, overwhelmingly to be executed is simply unconscionable. The sanctity of life is an absolute, uh, whether it's the unborn, the accidentally born, or the thoroughly guilty. 
E. King Alexander is a self-described cradle Episcopalian and Republican. An attorney, Alexander is on the National Advisory Board of Conservatives Concerned About the Death Penalty. Among the group's issues with capital punishment... It's not effective. It doesn't deter. It's vastly more expensive than life incarceration. And uh, it, it takes a very, very long time. It's very unsatisfactory in, in all aspects. Alexander says Louisiana has spent $110 million over the last 10 years on death penalty cases, the majority of that on the front end. You really have to have a double trial for a death penalty trial. You have to have the guilt phase, and then if there's a conviction of a death-eligible offense, then you have the penalty phase. And it's got to the point that only eight of our district attorneys out of 42 districts are as a practical matter, using the death penalty anymore. The rest of them have thrown in the towel because of the expense. This session, State Senator Dan Clater, a Republican, is joining with Democrat Representative Terry Landry to sponsor legislation with the goal of abolishing the death penalty. Deputy Attorney General Stiles says the public has already spoken and it's incumbent on the executive branch to carry out jurors' decisions. The number of exonerations, Stiles says, is proof the process works. Everyone who gets sentenced to death has a full opportunity to have his case vetted by multiple courts. Uh, and when, it, when he gets to that final uh, uh, judgment and that case is over with, we could honestly say that that person has had one of the fairest, most due processes probably in all of the world. The Gazardos, both Catholics, say they would never want to see an innocent person executed. The facts were there, the witnesses were there, uh, the evidence was there, the ballistics was there. Everything proved him guilty. We want justice. There's never closure. This will never go away. We will take this to our graves with us. I was on death row. And I went at the age of 21 and I was falsely convicted. What happened? Uh, my son, he died of serious pneumonia and uh, I went to, uh, I was charged with it, a smothering, and I went to uh, prison for it, and I was 21. I never want to see an innocent man be executed, but with the amount of appeals we went through, 23 years, all kind of objections and everything, for 23 years, he was found guilty beyond a reasonable doubt. Went all the way to the U.S. Supreme Court, voted eight to one. And uh, I, I take it as an insult when someone says, that is too expensive to execute. They're putting a price tag on my daughter's life. You know, the evidence that we have um, shows that Louisiana disproportionately targets people of color um, in capital charging and sentencing. It also shows that Louisiana has one of the highest rates of exonerations um, and one of the highest rates of uh, death penalty convictions that are later overturned. I want justice for my daughter. That's what I want. And I don't care. Do you think when we were told that our daughter was killed, that we asked if it, he was purple or gray or black or green? No. He killed our daughter. We lost one of the most precious things in our life other than our son. So do I have any sympathy for him? None at all. Well, I think violence begat violence. Um, I think death is so finite and so permanent that um, taking a life is not, uh, it's a form of violence, whether it's the government uh, executing or the violence on the street. If, if we are really going to practice life in the sanctity of life, uh, I, I would have to say that, that uh, we have to protect it. I'm not, there are some people I believe that should not be among us in society and I think that they should be put in a proper place. But as I inquire about those individuals that commit some of these crimes that are heinous, many of them are mentally disturbed, have mental problems. You've had seven states that have abolished the death penalty since 2007. And if you look at those seven states, a lot of them are very tiny states. Again, numbers are hard. At least in Maryland, for example, in New Mexico, the uh, rate of murder skyrocketed right after they, death, they abolished the death penalty. Now, there have only been two or three years since those states have abolished it. Uh, but, but that's true. I can show you the statistics from the Death Penalty Information Center, for example, that show that. Louisiana's death row 
has twice as many African American prisoners on it as make up the population of our state. It is double the rate. There isn't the slightest question that in terms of murder rate, rate of prosecutions for the death penalty, people who will be offered pleas or not, and people who juries will give a death penalty to, that there is a huge increase in the imposition of the death penalty on African American defendants and especially black defendants charged with killing a white person. Under 17 years of Doug Moore, we had 33 counts of death penalties. When you go to the majority of those, and I don't have the exact number, probably the majority of them were prosecuted by African-American prosecutors in front of African-American judges who you would think would be sensitive to this issue. And we had death penalty after death penalty, one five count death penalty returned with an African-American prosecutor in front of an African-American judge. So we have great diversity now, and I, I don't think that's happening. People will say, oh, those exonerations are from the bad old days when prosecutors were misbehaving or defense lawyers weren't well trained. Rodriguez was convicted of a crime he didn't commit and sentenced to death only a few years ago under the modern system. There are just some things human beings shouldn't be messing with. We're not good enough for it. Do you realize that since 2017 that 53 people convicted of first degree in the state of Louisiana have had their sentences commuted by the pardon board. Did you know that? 53. And as a prosecutor, I know there are times when I took a plea to first or second degree, second degree carries a life sentence also. I took the death penalty off the table and I took that plea and I told the family that that person who killed their loved one would be there forever. I can't tell them that anymore because I don't know. Republican Senator Dan Clater's bill to put an amendment abolishing the death penalty on next year's presidential ballot was rejected by the Senate 25 to 13. Democratic Representative Terry Landry also pulled his bill, ending the practice since there wasn't enough support in his chamber. And after being approved in the House, a proposal keeping lethal drug providers confidential was rejected in a Senate committee over transparency concerns. And a win for the governor, tweaks to his 2017 criminal justice reform legislation ultimately gained the support of state district attorneys. While Louisiana Public Square prepped you on the major topics coming up this session, Louisiana the State we're in, the show I co-anchor, brought you a legislative wrap each week. Through both programs, LPB is able to provide viewers with a unique opportunity to hear perspectives from different areas of the state. At the end of this session, I interviewed several lawmakers from around Louisiana to explain the wins and losses to their districts. Roads and education is, is two of the top priorities uh, with our citizens anytime that you talk about them. We've done a lot of other things here, uh, you know, th this session, but those are the two major pieces. And I think you know, when people, we get back home and people see uh, uh, what's happened, then I think they should feel good uh, uh, about the session. Senator Jim Fannin says one bill he passed will help encourage the future farmers of his mostly rural district. Our 4-H and, and, and future farmers uh, of America, we're dwindling, us old farmers are dwindling in number. So we need to be teaching our youth. So what I did was to pass a piece of legislation that exempts sales tax on all feed, seed, and fertilizer purchases for all of our, what I call, student farmers. Uh, so they get a break, mom and dad will get a break uh, on, when they're purchasing these things, when they want to uh, show an animal, when they want to do something in the gardening aspect that, that teaches them uh, what agriculture is truly about then we're, uh, we're giving them the break of sales tax. We didn't do much in, in terms of tax reform, which I knew because it's an election year. Um, unfortunate that we still couldn't pass minimum wage. Um, but I think by and large, the session was successful. Uh, with the teachers got a pay raise um, for the capital region. We made a really big investment in some of our longstanding um, capital outlay projects. So we were able to move some dollars from the BP settlement and now we're gonna focus those dollars on infrastructure. So those are wins for the capital region um, and in that bill included a, a big project for everyone across the state. A personal win for Representative Ted James came on House Bill 358, dealing with medical marijuana. The House overwhelmingly passed a measure that would let therapeutic cannabis patients use an inhaler like asthma patients use. The beauty of it is so many senators that voted against it on Sunday not only voted yes, but they took to the floor because they received calls from folks in their district. So it showed how important it is for 
everyday citizens to really be a part of the process because those calls, those personal calls, really impacted. And we picked up 12 votes, so we, we got it off the floor with 31 votes. It's been a learning experience. It's kind of like starting over in school. Each day is a new day. You think you know something, the next day you're reminded you don't know too much. Freshman Representative Wayne McMahon from Minden had several bills passed. One dealt with the rebranding of a community college in his district. We involved our, our technical college in Minden. Uh, we converted it from a, the last technical college to a community technical college. That's very important moving forward. It's going to help us continue to do what we've done for the last 40 plus years and educate the, the young men and women in our parish and, and, the, and really in all of Northwest Louisiana. Well, we were pushing for some related to children and particularly foster, foster children and the way that they're funded and how the, the finances previously really stayed with the parents and still going, instead of going with the children. And that bill will now make sure that the children are taken care of through whatever source of funding and support with the government all the way through, regardless of where they are. State Representative Mike Johnson of Pineville was one of 14 freshmen tackling his first session. Another bill he proposed and passed dealt with elder care. A bill related to health care and uh, making sure that we protect the elderly and that background checks are adequately run on, on people that, that have any kind of care with with our elderly and those that are most vulnerable. In a way, I guess you can call it successful. Uh, it's been kind of tedious in some instances, but I think the things that we've gotten out are, that are most important exactly are the teacher pay raises and the money that we've gotten for our school districts. State Representative Pat Smith, like many others, voicing her disappointment in failed attempts to raise the minimum wage and equal pay for women. That's so unfortunate that people don't understand the uh, the, really the worthwhileness of minimum wage, equal pay for women because we are an impoverished state. Those bills would actually help us move our people out of poverty and that's unfortunate that they don't recognize it. Well, in the next election cycle, roughly one third of state legislators are term limited. And before the next election, we will be highlighting issues from the Reset Louisiana Initiative. These are legislative policy recommendations from the Council for a Better Louisiana, the Public Affairs Research Council, and the Committee of 100. They are vital to Louisiana's future success because we need to learn the backgrounds of important issues. You may learn more at reset-louisiana. Com. You can view all the episodes from tonight's program online at lpb.org slash public square, or you can watch any of the Louisiana Public Square programs on the new LPB app. Browse the recent ones under News and Public Affairs, or click on the archive link to find older episodes. Well, coming up in the new season of Public Square, where we have dialogue about very difficult topics. Did you realize Louisiana leads the country in the rate of young people murdered through gun violence and unintentional shootings? Find out what the state is doing to combat gun violence on youth and guns. Wednesday, July 24th, here on Louisiana Public Square. Thanks for watching and good night. Good night, everyone. For a copy of this program, call 1-800-973-7246 or go online to www.lpb.org.